everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Joshua Kleinberg. I'm a professor of English at Miami-Dade College and Miami International University of Art and Design. Uh, thank you to Pace University for uh, running the Saturated Channel Festival uh, for having me. Uh, thank you also to Professor Dana Cadman uh, for setting this festival up and for inviting me. Um, if you guys would like to view the readings uh, that I mention in here, uh, I have them up in a little PDF file at my website, joshuakleinberg.com. Uh, our time together is limited, and this is kind of a big global look at fiction, so I'm going to try to keep it value-packed, which is to say a little bit quick-moving. Uh, I will, however, digress, invariably, uh, which is something I'll argue for a little bit later, but for now, you'll simply have to forgive me. Uh, I should also say, I might suggest a notepad, and you may even decide it's best to put your phone away, close out from other tabs, but we all get our information differently, and I recognize the value of a couple repeated low-stakes listens as well. Do your thing, and if you feel like I've only glossed something that you'd like to get more in-depth with, uh, I've got a second PDF on my site with the whole lecture script, plus some B-side material I won't have time for, which you might find helpful. Or you should totally feel free to email me with questions. Uh, my address is kleinberg at protonmail.com. There you are. Okay, so... I should start by apologizing for the animosity of this lecture's title and letting you know your scene probably doesn't suck. Generally, when a phrase of admonishment like that occurs to me, it's a self-reflexive gesture. That is, it's me talking to me, in this case, using the rhetorical you. My scenes suck. They still mostly do especially in early draft, and so I had to try to figure it out, and I had to try to figure out how to write them, which was a big, long, circuitous, and eternally incomplete journey I'll try to recreate here in miniature. Anyway, I can't even take credit for the title. The phrase, which really did start occurring to me in drumbeat fashion when I'd sit down and try to write, comes originally from a website run by the artist Rob Doby, uh, which chides the more performative aspects of a couple musical fandoms. In music, and in art, scene is often taken to mean that nebulous constellation of fans and institutional functionaries that surround the quote-unquote artists. In drama and screenwriting, it's got a different definition. It is, and this is a long and stentorian definition, but for good reason. In drama and screenwriting, a scene is one of a discrete and collectively exhaustive subdivisions of a work. Well, okay, what does this mean? This means that in plays and movies, the scene is the building block. It's where all the things happen. All the lessons you want to convey, all the emotions you want to portray or evoke, you have to sneak them on set during one of these guys. The scene. Movies and plays obviously have different formal constraints and conventions, so their scenes tend to operate quite differently. But what movies and plays share is that they both have to enact their ideas and emotion ringing on stage, or on a screen, which, after all, is a visual metaphor for the stage. And even if we're to understand that the stage actors pivoted monologue while all the other characters pause or file their nails is intended to show us not a scene as it's purported to have happened, but a character's inner thoughts, the type of thing you might call a personal essay if the character were to type it up and publish it in Harper's, we can see that shuffling a person up and having them deliver this material to us verbally is the scenic analog 
for a quality native to work meant to be read from the page. It lets us read people's minds. Because in drama and film, you always have to deal with the visual frame of the stage or the screen, there's an ever-present sense of place. Couple this with the auditory element, and you can see why the major plurality among contemporary audiences, who are, we should probably admit, beleaguered at all times by their lightning-fast uh, relationship to the information economy, tends to consider film and television richer and more rewarding than fiction. Not simply because reading is hard, it is for everyone, for years and years until one day it isn't, but because it's less sensorily stimulating. It's not so much that audience members are all imagistic or auditory learners, but that drama, film, and television engage you on as many sensory fronts as possible. Which, it turns out, is two, because the tactiles and smell of vision didn't go over. And even if you half-watch a movie, you can always wriggle away with the gist of it. They say 90% of interpersonal communication is nonverbal. If you missed what the protagonist said exactly, you can tell by the way she stands and delivers what, to some great extent, she is saying. As an audience member, this means you can afford to be a little bit lazier. Dip in and out between passive consumer and active critic. You won't come away with nearly what the artists intended, but you won't be lost either. When you dip out of something that you're reading, when you've got no visions of body language burned into short-term memory, or no extra diegetic music to let you know what the vibe is, you're lost. We've all been there. Running our eyes along pages for whole minutes as our minds are doing something else entirely. We review the page to see what we've moved through and it's totally foreign to us. Is that what we just read? Really? I'd have thought I'd remember that word. It's a weird one. Film, drama, television. These forms all certainly reward the same type of active engagement that the book absolutely requires, but they sit together across an aesthetic chasm from the book. They are different forms with vastly different conventions and formal constraints from books, and so they are better at some things and worse at other things not monolithically, but often. They're undeniably better at evocative scene work. In the book, you might marvel at spectacular descriptions of a vista or a gaudy nouveau riche party, but in the movies, you marvel at the spectacle itself. And the rules for portraying these things are thus very different. In the movies, you wrangle an art director, a costume department, a director of photography, a sweeping musical score, and some actors whose every eye flutter is motivated. You achieve spectacle by agglomerative force. You control for everything that you can, and then you show it to us. Plus a vibe you impart with your formal decisions. Now, despite this old teacherly cliche you'll all recognize, that we ought to show, not tell. A book is really nothing but telling, with some of what we might call non-scenic analogs of its own, to go with drama's scenic analog for inner argument, the soliloquy. These non-scenic analogs give the impression of scene via squiggles on some pulped up trees. If a fiction writer attempted to recreate a scene agglomeratively, that is, by piling up detail upon detail until every inch of a theoretical scene or setting or image was shaded in, it would read like technical copy. You would be bored to gasps, and if you gave it a shot, your mind's eye would bat around trying to populate items and angles and missing persons' descriptions of every character, translating pitches and registers into affect, until you had some Frankenstein version of whatever exact image the author had. And you would, without fail, miss the forest for the trees. I 
could do a really accurate geometric accounting of the finial pattern on a rug, but only some readers would know I was describing, or trying to describe, as it were, a Persian rug of the kind that probably evokes a freakily similar mental image for most of us. When a Persian rug's on the floor in a movie, no one says Persian rug. It's shown to you in color captured on celluloid, a quadrilateral of some sort with a see-it-to-believe-it level of detail. To call it a Persian rug is to introduce that activity the written word is so much better at, the tracing of thought. Now we're editorializing. Now it's not a quadrilateral with finials. Now the author is taking over some of the interpretive work. Perhaps we should call him an auteur, only we should do the French accent more pretentiously than that. Maybe it becomes, under the weight of our pens, a save-a-lot Persian rug, implying something drastically different, of course, from an ornate or an unusually vivacious Persian rug. If you want it to read as cheap and crappy in a movie, you've got to shoot it that way, finding certain visual metaphors that would imply the same thing the editorializing save-a-lot does. Scene in fiction requires a skill that your least favorite boss ever, or any boss if you're a copy editor, might refer to as triaging. What, tria what triaging means is assigning degrees of urgency. I suppose it'd be more precise to call the fiction writer's expertise in selective depiction an assignment in degrees of importance and not technically urgency, but let's be real. We've already acknowledged that audiences, due to rational self-interest and the onslaught of the information economy, don't really find reading that easy or worthwhile. They always fall asleep, they say, or they itch to do something quote-unquote productive. I'm begging you, don't try to commandeer these afflicted people's attention for the 45 minutes it takes to read a short story, and definitely not the 4 or 5 or 10 or 20 hours it takes to read a novel, without having first ensured that all of those words urgently need to be communicated that exact way. There are different regimes for ordering this, and some writers can be delightfully expansive, but some version of this is the ultimate reason a lot of elder white male writers inspire eye rolls among a lot of younger and seemingly especially female readers. It's a thin line between delightfully expansive and bloviating to hear yourself bloviate. And the most self-indulgent of that work can make a reader feel like their time is being disrespected. It's 2020. We've got Netflix and Instagram and we still don't have dishwashers, which I mean, a privileged American problem, no doubt, but we're living 70 years behind on the household automation front and, like, 50 years ahead when it comes to the little attention economy terminal in our pockets that's just screeching and beeping and flashing colors at us all day. In these super highly engineered dopamine feedback cycles designed to be addictive in the same way insufflatable ammonia made cigarettes, both in real life and in The Insider, whose soundtrack is probably Banksy's greatest work. And then there's whatever weird tallowy Huxleyan process they used in McDonald's french fries to physically compel you to grab another. But back to this corporate colonization of the American attention span. They, uh, ought to probably treat this as the public health epidemic it is, but they won't until our politics looks a lot more like our populace on all the metrics. I have no guess as to when, if ever, this might be possible. In a best case scenario, I don't know. Next midterm. Anyway, the point is they're out here using really sophisticated science to monopol monopolize the attention of every person in your possible audience. So cut your soon-to-be readers some slack if they're not willing to go with you for 14 pages on some therapeutic score-settling jaunt to tell a character who really looks like your ex they weren't good enough for you and their genitals had certain weirdnesses. I think, post-quarantine, authors are going to have to contend with a cleavage in the landscape just as seriously as artists are, in the latter case due to global gallery consolidations and all that. 
It's been on its way down the pike for a while, but it looks like this will probably be a leap. Gen Z was already leaving the house less often. We were already buried to the gills in content, bad mainly, indentured to the economy via student debt, glorifying hustle and the conspicuous consumption that greases its rails because it offered us a chance to fantasize about having control of our own destinies. After all, this America may just succeed in domesticating itself, but there is a healthy and an unhealthy way to do that. Do young authors and fine artists simply quit making art when the writing on the wall totally clarifies about just how few toeholds about just how few toeholds these consolidating institutions are going to be handing out from here on out? Do artists speed their process ever faster? cynically conducting zombie formalism or jack-in-the-box nano-fiction? Do they toil over zombie formalism's literary cousin, the workshop story? Do they ever make it out of the slush pile? Do they begin to make it out of the slush pile, having shown no practical improvement? Do they bother to make it good enough, or do they just need something out there in the world to prove people like them? Is the literary world a predominantly social place? Does the art reduce back to a psychosocial chit? Do these new artists make like the micro serfs of Generation X, negotiate a ton of smoke breaks, an HMO that tells them to cut back, and a bi-weekly allowance from the server farm, proceeding to mentally pretzel themselves into believing, for example, that for-profit insurance is a good and noble service they offer unto the world? If you're an artist or a writer who bails on the dream for a paycheck, it'll either be that, a future where you look back on your current self and are merely puzzled, though if you ever hold your gaze on the thought, you'll start to get mournful. Either this, or you'll spend your days in the sales pen, looking over your shoulder, trying to err on the unnoticed side with your bosses, taking the longest bathroom breaks, seething getting really into video games or QAnon or Russiagate or whatever of their analogs are forthcoming. Will young literary authors and fine artists go indie? Will they band together to build institutions of their own on the fairer foundation they say they want to see? Will they figure out how to make these things sustain them? Might a political solution be possible, perhaps as a prong in the fight? A new deal for arts and the media to combat the vast media political complex of, here's a throwback term, the consolidated interests. Could that possibly work the way you'd hope it would? Would the interests buy off the most saleable of the gate crashers' ranks, make a buck, squish the politics, take the wind out of the indie sales? Would the art suck? Could it possibly suck any more than what's selling now? On a practical level, could you even get the money into earnest hands, or would it devolve into another gatekeepy, seat-warming patronage scheme? The healthy way Americans proceed after this looks a lot like, and excuse an unprecedented second blast from the past discourse reference, uh, a healthy model in a new subdued world might touch on the Danish notion of hygge. 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 In this possible American future, we get cozy and learn to love our broods, like really love them, to do for them and spend time slightly bored and slightly preoccupied with them, to make art around them, to read books, to read them books, to smoke just one in the bedroom with them, the Parisian ease of it, the shears waving in the early sun, to make of our lives a summer camp, we don't have to buy all the gas in the pump. That problem you just felt acutely today that absolutely had to be sated with an impulse purchase at gas station markup prices, this problem no longer so enthralls us. Like meat if we give it up or employee morale, consumerism is a habit that fades when you quit jerry-rigging your whole worldview to prop it up. The anthropologist Alexei Yurchak coined the term hypernormalization to speak of the mood in the Soviet Union's final two decades. 
Wikipedia sums that up nicely here. Everyone in the Soviet Union knew the system was failing, but no one could imagine an alternative to the status quo. And politicians and citizens alike were resigned to maintaining the pretense of a functioning society. Over time, this delusion became a self-fulfilling prophecy, and the fakeness was accepted by everyone as real, an effect that Yurchak termed hypernormalization. I don't know, maybe we'll get poorer and better as a nation, but I doubt it. You get alcoholism and drug abuse, gun violence and decay when nations with what I'd call revanchist cultural fundamentals start to fidget backward. I'm not sure Barack Obama ever really knew just how prescient his portrayal of American society as, quote, balkanized may still yet turn out to be. The unhealthy way we glide inward looks like, I don't know, the South Park World of Warcraft episode, or if we let it go long enough, the Matrix pod rescue scene minus the rescue. Not really, but humor me. Or it looks like all that stuff I just said, and possibly some Isherwood warned us implications that I don't want to enunciate any more specifically than that. Anyway, what the future is going to be like is a question art and literature will sort out better than I can in this space. I do sincerely hope the needless death stops. One bright possibility is that more time at home may mean more time for books. If America manages to take a sort of homey arts and crafts movement lesson out of this time, but I doubt that's the move. I think previous trends will simply hasten. People will frequently let their id win out. Take jackpot quick hit dopamine from the candy game. Get really infantile and icky with it. And probably devolve a little more into all the unsavory crannies of hikikomorihood, inceldom, and thoughtery. I worry also about fascism, for real. So I'm saying what, shorter books or some kind of toolkit newly accorded with the metamodernist's concept of aggregation or something, some techie, spooky, gray-faced coral lot of characters happening from far away, dignifying their brief stay where they wound up with eccentric systems we come to see as both universal, universal, and importantly, gloriously unique. Less David Foster Wallace, more Gabriel Garcia Marquez. More Parable of the Sower, less Slaughterhouse-Five. More work in translation. Way less patrician, Greenwich, Connecticut, psycho-subtlety snuff. If it seems like there's a racially redistributive aspect to these picks, I'd argue it's a reshuffling along class axes to the approximate same extent. Tokenism is a really ugly practice, one that's entirely imposed by a white and, importantly, landed publishing clack on writers of color and on all readers. It's never the fault nor particularly the responsibility of anyone, but the intellectually lazy so-called intellectuals who occupy these Oxbridge or Yarbird captured gigs keeping gates for BP with their prize sponsorships. And hand these little secret keys out. I think authors who've written weird offers are guilty of nothing, and they deserve no additional sentence than the time they've served among snakes. Perhaps some literary acknowledgement that our readers might actually have something to do, so if we don't know exactly what we want to say, if there aren't any really clear stakes in our story, maybe we as authors should either um, acknowledge our audience's desires be a little more generous with the bones we throw them, and if it's vague or unclear or not working or boring, maybe we head back to the desk and fix these things rather than claiming our chosen fictional style allows for these things. Fictional styles don't allow the writer to do things. Readers do. Or perhaps we stop trying to make all our work politically palatable for the gatekeepers. Perhaps that by doing so, we've been rendering ourselves token for years, no matter who we are. The political palability of institutionally championed works is not immediately penetrable to the undergraduate lit student. But if you know what you're looking at, you start to see there's not a lot in these anthologies with the politics to the left of Joe Biden. 
a lot of colonizers present and some token phenomenal pushback, always something minor from these rabble-rousers. Uh, in Octavia Butler's story in the newest Norton intro to Lit, that's like the most grotesquely off-putting thing they could have picked. Multiple students squirmed. The story was panned. A notion of this particular inclusion as maybe a setup, meant to make the genre stuff seem laughable. Parable of the Sower, since confirmed, would have killed. Nearby, a similarly minor William Gibson short that bored us to tears. The science fiction relegated to a weird little patronizing special theme corner with some fairy tale flavored lit work that proved its metal on the indie circuit before selling at auction for a not unkind amount. When a publisher pays that much for a short story collection, they want to see some payoff in the anthologies, I suppose. Meanwhile, in the Norton world literature, the, manifest the manifestos get their own special corner as well. The selection hewing to the laughable, although I do think the canonization of Valerie Solanus on the strength of her celebrity is exactly what Andy Warhol deserves for founding celebrity culture. Anyway, I felt it most acutely last summer. The full scope of the politics of the canon. The Norton World Literature Anthology, department mandated, seemed good to me at first. I taught a six-week class at Miami-Dade, offered to me on a whim by the department secretary, with like three and a half hour classes or something. One day, a student brought up James Baldwin, and I saw there was a little excerpt in the anthology, which I went and read aloud. In the moment, I hadn't thought much of it, in part because when I'm reading to a class, I'm still pretty nervous, and I get a little lightheaded and often don't know what I'm saying. But I started to think about the excerpt that night and felt more and more uneasy. It was from Notes of a Native Son, but it ended well before the essay's actual ending, uh, with something that I think it's fair to say had kind of a much more palliative message. A politics you might call neoliberal in the parlance of the quote-unquote discourse. In the Norton, it becomes a story about a young black kid learning to hold his tongue so he doesn't get hit. Not the essay James Baldwin published. Where had I seen this practice before, I thought. Right, in a Malcolm X excerpt I'd found online while spastically gobbling up teaching resources on the internet. Not one year prior, with a week to go before my first freshman comp classes out in the Miami suburb of Kendall. The file had an EDU subdomain, and it seemed to be a well-known class resource, something that may have been frequently assigned. There were many near-identical PDF entries in the search results. This one had been cut the same way. Another excerpt that simply exhumed and left lingering an incomplete and palliative message. Essentially just some reading is fundamental claptrap. In the very next paragraphs, Malcolm X goes on to talk a very convincing litany of inconvenient sense about a whole bunch of beloved institutions. That doesn't tend to make the excerpts. And I wouldn't have ever realized if I hadn't in some subsequent semester gobbled up a slightly different PDF resource when once again bashing around for my readings. In whatever happens post-COVID, we should not only reserve more spots for writers of color in our institutional ranks and the canon constituted by the handful of survey-sized textbooks that bother plopping into existence, we should not only give those writers more space and more solicitously invite their institutional critiques, or at least not torque their messages to align with institutional politics, we should also go back and re-examine those writers whose work these same institutions deemed unfit for patronage in a bygone era. What were these authors saying exactly, the ones who dropped out? Ishmael Reed was tossing gauntlets at industry sweethearts since before we were probably all born. He was proverbially calling for the heads of 80s academics who were reclaiming Hitler on some crude, aimless, epartez le bourgeois kick. He was literally calling for an Alice Walker stand-in's hair on some French collaborator sadism. It unnerved the establishment, to say the least, and the author of the Neo-Hoodoo Manifesto, critiquer of Eliot and Pound as racists and colonizers about half a century before it was cool, 
slowly stopped getting even crumbs of press. No major outlets bothered to review his latest novel, Conjugating Hindi. The Times, picking up the Lin-Manuel play for likely algorithmic reasons, just panned it in their scurrilously fretful way. Uh, in his most recent interview with Rishi Nath at the Asian American Writers Workshop, he was in usual fiery form, calling Allen Ginsberg a racist, Juno Diaz a token, and revealing that the late Toni Morrison had produced his recent off-off-Broadway play, the aforementioned haunting of Lin-Manuel Miranda. Don DeLillo gently chided those same 80s Nazi fetishist academics with the haha -ha funny notion of a whole department of Hitler studies, and his agent apparently feels so strongly that that's a Nobel's worth of brave commentary that he got a guy to see the Nobel idea in book forum. A few years removed from them literally passing dude over for another white American male who wrote one book of percussive, cut-up free verse while on a bender. You don't think they were sitting around their little table, sexually subjugated assistants taking minutes, going, of course it'll mean no more of their white men for a time. I like to think of some spectacled Nobel Committee functionary very smartly deadpanning and, oh no... I actually love Don DeLillo, but I think a Nobel is a stupid thing to want, except as a business tool. Which, you gotta shoot your shot, I guess. In any case, I'd have preferred a DeLillo to a Dylan Nobel, both behind Reed. Uh, I do love Bob Dylan, though, and I hate that Nobel Prize they gave him so much. No one writing a report about the death of the book is gonna miss the opportunity to put that one on their timeline. Anyway, the kayfabe laundering of Nobel consideration is nothing new. I remember when Richard Ford's agent did it in, I don't know, Newsweek or Time. <laughs> I bet there's one a year if you look it up. I bet the publishers have a gentleman's agreement. Ford's Independence Day, which won the 1996 Pulitzer and Penn Faulkner Awards, only book to ever do that was a book about a landlord whose salty relationship with his black tenant was not his fault. Yeah. I should say, I think Ford puts on absolute clinics as a writer, far more than I ever saw in, like, Roth, though I'm not an expert. Uh, but it's telling the uh, people that we focus on the opinions that we focus on, the mindsets that we focus on. Anyway, part of this new look post-COVID literature should probably be a little bit of pressure on the author to make damn sure they're not bloviating, especially from positions of privilege, whether demographic, financial, sexual, institutional, psychological, aesthetically, or in an ableist way. When privileged authors bloviate, all they do is archive their dimness about how abnormal their relationships to like, like, about how abnormal their relationships to luck and the mic are. What this means. Well, one of these corny SEO guys might say the author of the future will need to be ever more delivering content. A drop in content quality at any point in the text will lead to so-and-so bounce rate. We could track it on Kindles, print you out a little heat map, and we'd have a template for revisions before the second edition. We could choose word of mouth sales by 8 to 12 per. The Italian author Italo Calvino very playfully imagined it in If on a Winter's Night a Traveler, but I'm not going to act like there isn't something boot-clackingly dystopian about it also. If any Rage Against the Machine or George Orwell fans are watching, you'll recognize the excellent Cohen from 1984, who controls the past, controls the future, who controls the present, controls the past. The algorithms are beating the crumbs off the authors in the attention wars, and that's a problem. 
because the authors have information they urgently need to get across to us, and the algorithms just want to smuggle their messages in on a wave of ours. They're good at it, like McDonald's and Philip Morris are good at their things. And authors and readers alike are going to have to address the new attention realities, or not only are books going to be relegated to a zero attention share, to eccentric relics in the, spirits, in the spirit of ships in a bottle, but learning as an actual intentional practice may largely join it, with academia rendered to a series of digital radio form multiple choices engineered to be completed on autopilot, and for the hobbyist autodidact, get-rich-quick schemes the predominant subject. If we forget what kind of deep attention certain knowledges need us to render them as offering, if we think all the meaningful knowledge to be gained in life can be gotten from a YouTube video or a Google search or a listicle, if we tell ourselves that our aversion to heavy intellectual lifting is good and right, we are darkening rooms all over our mansion of potential. That's as readers and as thinkers. As authors, the diminished attention cannot mean that we give in to the porny or likable or dumbed down or corny or unambitious or affectless or trite impulses that would make our path an easier one. It means literary novels should stop hitting bookshelves on the strength of 30 phenomenal introductory pages, the generally accepted length for agent submissions and litfic advances, if you were ever going to get one, and then 330 more pages, constituted mainly of what Hollywood would call second act problems. Literary novels completed on deadline that feel rushed in some cases, in others improperly compacted by editorial hand, which I tend to take as a sign that the author was just turning in scraps and the editor and agent in conjunction are probably miracle workers. What else does this mean? It means books should maybe stay in pre-publication longer, perhaps as Hollywood movies do that the lists should shrink, that books should be events, that a lot of pretenders should take an honest look at the shitpost grade stuff for which they're begging for exposure. And importantly, these internet shitposts should refuse to give their art up. They should carve from this future a humble existence that allows to them to service their art dutifully. Frank O'Connor talked about the difference between young American and European writers as a split between smooth-shouldered Protestant ethicists and desperate starvelings who'd live off a prostitute if they had to to make their art. He was stumping for the Europeans, I should say. Don't become a pimp, but get your art done. Beg, borrow, and steal, and if you're too timid to do so, figure something out. But don't fall into the work a job to come home and do Netflix until the job again. You need to be working on your stuff. Go live on a wolf farm or something. Save up and quit. Piss your parents off. Just do it. Whoever heard of Shakespeare's parents? Credit for that line to William Faulkner, who reportedly shouted the obvious variant at his daughter when she tried to nag him into hanging out. In any case, we should all cleanse ourselves of whatever wispy notion we still have of our art as a chit in a psychosocial scene. The art world, the lit scene, Minnesota's early 90s hardcore scene. Camaraderie is over. Make your art. Give the post-war culture FOMO a hot rest. These are gauche and kind of relics. There. And you thought that intro about art scenes and stuff would never come back. What else should this mean for books? It means the industry should focus on core priorities because they're shoveling a lot of bad product, a lot of which gets pulped or sold embarrassingly at dollar stores, but occasionally the marketing totally does its thing and they manufacture us a hit on the merits of no one's ever really sure what, but rule number one of the literary publishing world is do not mess 
with anyone's sales. So all the writers are happy to bubble on nondescriptly about it if, you know, you think it'll help. The bad product on the market doesn't have to get scuttled or pulped, though. It just has to be improved. It has to become the seed for further developments. The people of the world need this art, but we as authors and artists have got to hold our own feet to the fire. We have got to insist on self-critique when all of what we are seeing is trying to orient us around self-forgiveness. No matter what the Wellness Brigade tells us, we have got to insist on self-critique. We should cleanse ourselves of our snobberies and take our lessons where we can get them. We should use art to understand. Because the page is bound differently than the screen or the stage, books will never die as a source of relaying advanced information sets. It's really amazing how much world a book has in it for its size. I've got a war and peace around here no more than half as thick as my coffee pot. But if you've read War and Peace, if you took part or are taking part or have heard of the great Yi Yun Lee Tolstoy readathon, which would probably make a pretty good audiobook if it's archived. I don't know, you should post it in the comments if you find it. Uh, you know just how much those little squiggles on pulped up trees expand when you add in the gray matter. Whereas in the movies, the scene has to be delicately agglomerated by crew across departments. Blown up, or more likely in this day, shrunken down before you see it, but in either case bound, self-contained, a movie stops at the edge of the screen. The book, on the other hand, is a machine for thinking, an ever-inflating moss that grows over you between reeds, something that moves you differently through the world, even when you're in its grips. It expands in the head. A book does. A quote, depressing, abandoned hospital, in my mind's eye, gets a peeling lozenge pink and a royal green. An ominous, abandoned hospital, on the other hand, gets a night vision scheme in my mind's eye. The author won't always, will perhaps rarely, see the same thing as any member of the audience, but whomever you are, the squiggles come and make you see visions. You need a meditative focus. You perhaps need a great adjustment to your habits, but to read, to learn to read attentively, to skim where you must, to open books up and break them down and bop around in them, to leave books open all around the house, to dissuade yourself from whatever biblio fetish makes you wrongly prize non-annotated, undog-eared books and reserve annoying dust jackets and pamper your books like your entire life is an Instagram flat lay. They're information delivery systems. They are rugged, and when broken in, they fit the reader like a good boot. Even the gorgeous ones should be abused. You'll never destroy a book. If you soak it entirely through, it might still be useful. If it loses its cover, it's still got the words in it. If someone's dog chews it to a new shape, I'll bet you nearly all those words are still there. If the dog does business on it, I mean, all right, I'm not unhinged. Uh, you'll never actually have time to read all the books that you absolutely, absolutely need to own. That doesn't mean anything that you won't read each one. You should have them all. You should have them around, peeking at you. You should not cling to a cruddy book for eight weeks, page a day, fighting a brutal fight against your distaste for it, all because you're superstitious about putting it down. Put it down. Find 12 more. Come back to this one. Maybe it'll turn out you need it later. Maybe it'll be just as bad, or maybe the next page will mention another book you have. 
and would prefer to check out. And here is a news alert for you. You do not need to read every book from copyright to acknowledgments. The people who still know that if you ever actually want to understand something, you get three books on it and you futz around in them, it is to these people that the future belongs. They know how to bounce a couple separate knowledge banks on any given topic against each other to create a self-specific comprehension. They'll grow to five books, to seven if the topic seems to warrant or if they're interested in departing from the investigative direction of the first three. They'll probably pass over one book max worth of words. That is okay. They have still read seven books. They have an entirely new cosmology in their head now. The outline of it, anyway. God bless the book the novel, the short story, the essay, all that. God bless the literary and the genre. All right, this concludes the pep talk portion of the lecture. Uh, now we're gonna talk Turkey, as it were. So we began by defining the scene in drama and film. The scene in drama and film is one of the discrete and collectively exhaustive subdivisions of a work. Remember? But in all fiction meant to be read, the scene is just one of a number of the things we can be doing. If we had to search for a discrete and collectively exhaustive system of subdividing novels and short stories, the things the market refers to as fiction, it might behoove us to start at the scene, because to have a story and not, for example, an essay, you probably need to have at least one. Well, okay. If fiction professors wanted to drill deep into scene and scene logic as an element of story building, they could go through the whole Joseph Campbell cosmogony and beyond. They could, in theory, be trying to teach us deep er myths to tap into as storytellers. That could be the latest and greatest in workshops cor workshoppers quarterly, but it's not and not just because Workshoppers Quarterly doesn't exist. Those aren't the types of conversations they're having in the annals of the literary. Why not? I don't want to offer big prescriptivist dogmas or anything, but it's one of the established notions about literary and genre fiction that the former operates on the abstract logic of the character arc, while the latter is driven by its plot. Gone Girl, sci-fi stuff, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. These genre books are about developments. They're about plots, scenes. They follow a materialist logic of increasing stakes and scene turns. They're closer to movies and episodic TV. They sell better, and the best of them sneak in a thematic zinger or two, but always as a way to inject some heft into a story whose operative pursuit is some analog of solve the mystery, save the beloved, capture the Guga. They also exist more heavily in scene. When we say, on the other hand, that literary fiction is about character, what this means in a drearily practical sense is that the systems with which literary writers examine their constructed people, their characters, that is, will be the most robust and developed systems in the joint. Don't mistake this qualitative assessment for a quantitative one. Rather than adapting some hero with a thousand faces checklist, works of literary fiction will emphasize the human inner life drilling down into psychologies, psychosocial relations, the surreal underbelly of the id. A more abstract, lyrical logic, subconscious adjacent, turns the scenes and informs the story's progression through scenes. 
It's a logic Frederick Barthelme references and my favorite of his famous 39 steps, number 24. Number 24. Doing odd stuff is good, especially like when you make characters do it in the story, like when stuff is happening to them and they just do this unexpected, even inappropriate stuff, and then somehow it makes a little sense. This fills the heart. That is about as prescriptive as the literary fiction professor is usually willing to get. Academic thinking on fiction craft, for various reasons, talks about these things in an accumulative way. Meaning, fiction classes read some really elegantly done stories, and instructors point out their favorite brilliant stuff, and ask their students to search for brilliant stuff too, and point that out. And putting a bunch of really elegantly done examples behind you in the reading list, the theory goes, will allow the students to build up their technique bank which, with a bit of artful derangement, can be deployed to help students wobble through a couple pale imitations of their elegantly done examples, eventually beginning to bounce their lessons off each other and jostling or deranging the logics even of their thefts via structural pastiche, collage, and intuition until the students' tools are adequately honed at which point they'll write some truly original, self-specific stuff, all of which constitutes a process known as finding your voice. This methodology admirably prevents the dangerous hubris of know-it-all totalizing schemes, and it does something to preserve the abstract wonder you find in the narrator of Walt Whitman's When I Heard the Learned Astronomer. If you're not familiar with the poem, the speaker gets taught some of the dumb physics underlying astronomy, which causes him to lose all interest in the stars he once loved. 130 or so years later, Ben Stiller used this plotline practically verbatim to pick up Winona Ryder during what story theorist Matt Bird would call their I See You scene in 1994's Reality Bites. Figuring out how to write stories through these inherited, eggheadish frameworks can feel that way, Whitman's way, disenchanting, overly programmatic, and hedonia-inducing. Especially when you start thinking in concepts like the I see you scene. Systematizing is anathema to the current academic craft milieu, and not without reason. It's not just about maintaining the chaos within oneself, as Nietzsche had it, that one must jealously guard if one hopes to give birth to a dancing star. You won't hear maudlin talk like this in most fiction w workshops, but that's ultimately a pretty decent description of the thing their hands-off approach is geared to not get in the way of. <laughs> the bad news is, the lessons you take from these classes can feel glancing, occasional, haphazard. The good news is, you avoid expulsion from the Garden of Eden. That is, if you start eating from programmatic knowledge trees, you're liable to stunt yourself, focusing on stuff like I see you scenes. Instead of making art, you'll recreate all the worst tendencies of the skittish Hollywood executive who needs certain demagogic boxes checked before he's going to even think about a marketing push. Like the I see you scene. Systematizing is anathema to the literary workshop and not without reason, I think I said that already. Part of it though is probably about maintaining a healthy dose of the chaos within one's, oh, I went backward, I'm sorry. Back to the classes and how they can feel glancing, occasional, and haphazard. That you may be paying tuition for them is a little bit absurd on its face, given the creative writing workshop's refusal to do anything with a whiff of what Paolo Freire called pedagogy in the bank deposit model. The good news is we stay on the right side of the Garden of Eden.
So literary professors mostly see their job as shepherding, as kind of walking us through. They generally do not attempt to break things down exhaustively. They speak as close to the ground as possible. When they talk about scene, they often distinguish it from summary. The first obvious metaphor here is the zoom lens or the zoom function in a more contemporary parlance. When you zoom in, you get seen. Zoom out, you get summary. Pretty simple. You can also think of this distinction in passage of time terms, in which case maybe a treadmill or some other analog for a path, maybe a run-through in contemporary parlance, uh, might be most apt. If you speed through time, you have summary. Slow time down, put words in people's mouths and some color on the room, you got scene. Why did this dichotomy keep coming up in the literary workshops I took? Largely, it was due to discussions of pacing, a pet concern of the literary fiction workshop. Though pacing concerns were often mislabeled by fellow students and myself, uh, motivation concerns. This zoomable, scrubbable dichotomy between scene and summary makes sense in literary fiction because that's the elastic way time works in memory, which is the setting to all our psychological journeys, as well as the relevant expanse across which either we meaningfully change or as Rust Hill, the former Esquire fiction editor elaborated the idea, lose our last opportunity to change. The literary story, you'll note, has much more tolerance for the down ending than the skittish Hollywood exec does. It being full of people who lose their last opportunities to change. Now, between the scene and the summary, you often find this in-between state. Uh, I started by calling it habitual scene before shortening it to habit. It was something I managed to do by intuition for a while. Habit, this in-between state that would allow you to slowly fiddle the tense into a new position, like passing a card from knuckle to knuckle. It was a slip slidey realm, this kind of pastiche middle ground. What Rust Hill called fixed action and explained loosely as action in service of characterization. We have scene, habit or habitual scene, and summary. So okay, the literary writer is already a little worried about the scene stuff. Not only is it slow, which sounds a lot like dull, it's also very close up where the people are. The literary writer is a writer of ideas. Have you heard the literary writer's theories about male homosocial constipation? Here, let the literary writer tell you by having a narrator think these things, perhaps while moping around the house. Beginning literary writers have a lot of really excellent examples of stuff that, to their newcomer's eye, kind of looks like the above. A mopey narrator thinking through stuff. But usually, their newcomer's eye is just missing a lot of background work, wowed by the wordplay or the watchworks precision of the literary devices or the psychosocial insight that makes up the vast qualitative, if again, not the quantitative, majority of the story. But without any set rubric for plot beats to hit or scene elements to cycle through, literary students are left to follow their noses with whatever degree of awareness they showed up with. This is a little like learning to swim by getting tossed into the pool. 
As long as you can keep from drowning, you'll settle on a form pretty quickly. And often, because they're groping in the dark, students in these classes will use their own relationships as templates, which can sometimes lead to the embarrassments of, as mentioned previously, score settling and wish fulfillment. But when sensitively witnessed and elegantly recreated or abstractly reimagined under convincing Freudian auspices, the best literary stories these students produce do a thing genre stories mostly don't. They punch us in the zone out button by showing us they know us more intimately than we thought was possible. Not at the gut level where we know that a Google commercial can prod our lizard brain buttons, but somewhere that needs the reader's head to form an agreement something that shouldn't be misunderstood as Spockian or pretentiously intellectual. Adventurous plot, of course, is kind of a lizard brain thing. It's a more ravenous pursuit. And most literary work would benefit from a couple little lizard brain button pushes. The particular flavor of tingle in the spine that literary fiction does best is the feeling of communion that jumps you when you finally read something you'd already known, just never in words. It's a conversation across time, a book is, between two people who understand each other, if glancingly. So, okay, we've got scene. We've got habit, we've got summary. But this writer of ideas business has us thinking about some of the other stuff that happens in literary stories. Stuff that, when you break it down, looks a lot more like that thinking we've been talking about than it does look like remembering or any form of tripping between scenes. Uh, we're talking here about writing that exists past scene and summary, that arrives on the page without a setting, stuff you might call essayistic or discursive. This, the following, is as I've mentioned the stuff with which the written word has a much easier time than plays and film and TV approximating thought. And if we want, we can split it into degrees. Some thinking in fiction is reflexive, turning back on the details of scenes and their summaries and mining them for meaning or resonance, often via that good old lyrical logic they like so much on the lit farm. This is meaning at a heady, not a guttural level, and fiction professors mostly love it because it is beginning to take up the intellectual tools that only fiction really provides. This is when fiction comes into its own. If you're going to flit from long view scene to close up scene through the whole thing, you can probably jam that into a movie script and rent a telephoto lens. But if you're doing something that needs to be a story, you're probably making use of all the tools that fiction puts at your disposal, especially the ones that other forms can't do or that they can't do as well. Uh, all this extra writing puts us firmly in a realm that looks a lot like essaying. Uh, okay, but we've said we can cut it down. Uh, Further down the line from reflection is, and this is an imperfect thing, I apologize, digression. Non-reflexive thought, thought that is moving on its own rather than turning back on something from the book. So, we got ourselves seen, we got habit, summary, reflection, 
and digression. One thing we might notice, and we'll start to see this when we get into some of the examples, it's kind of a gradient. Scene kind of slides over into habit, kind of slides into summary, kind of slides into reflection, slides into digression. Uh, but when you realize that digression often assumes its place in the lyrical, subconscious, adjacent logic of literary fiction by serving as a, an occasional bridge between scenes, uh, which more often in literary fiction turns on this or some other lyrical logic, you can see it's not a line. It's kind of more of a circle. Literary fiction takes, almost as its first order of business, the artful blurring of the lines between these gradient entries. But even if you write genre fiction, which tends to hew pretty closely to a hyper-developed emphasis on the scenes informing only the first gradient entry, scene. You can generally make a failing scene suck a little less by bopping around the circle a bit, by trying to work some literary into your repertoire. So, okay, let's look at some examples. We're gonna start at the top with scene. From Elmore Leonard's Rum Punch, which was made into the Quentin Tarantino uh, Pam Greer vehicle, Jackie Brown. Jackie dialed the number she'd tried before. The young woman's voice said, he ain't, and Jackie said over it, tell him Jackie called. There was a silence. Tell him I'm in jail, the stockade. Have you got that? There was a silence again before the line went dead. She picked up her bed sheets from the picnic table, the women still watching her, and scuffed her way back to the eight double bunks in two rows. There were no overhead lights here, but the ones in the front, Jackie imagined, would be left on all night. So take a lower bunk. Five already had sheets on them. A radio was playing now, along with the television set, the movie. She chose a bunk, wondering if she'd be able to sleep, and bent over, one hand on the rail of the upper bunk to look at the mattress. Something behind her moved in front of the light. Jackie knew who it would be as she straightened and turned to look over her shoulder at Ramona. Heavy set, her skin dark, her black wig highlighted from behind. She said, you gonna talk to me? If you want, Jackie said, just don't give me a hard time, okay? I've got enough problems. You a stewardess, huh? Work for the airlines? Jackie nodded and Ramona said, what I was wondering, they pay pretty good? This is all seen, and it does the number one and two things a good, straightforward potboiler scene needs to do. It makes meaning from subtext, and it shows an intersection between characters at cross, if ever so slightly, purposes. The ambivalent language keeps the tension up in much the same way a Raymond Carver narrator operates. The ever so slight quality of the character's cross purposes could be benign, but we're picking up on some vibe static that intrigues us and we might choose to read on. Uh, gonna move over to, I'm actually gonna set this up here now, because the point I wanted to make is not just that you can kind of slide around the edges of this circle while working, uh, you can also bounce around and free, you know, it's not, there's no, you know, you don't have to pass habit to get to summary if you start in scene. Um, you can go wherever you want. It obviously needs to feel like a meaningful transition. Uh, and there are tools for doing that, you know, 
I guess, between any of these places. Uh, moving on, I'm going to talk about an example of habit or habitual scene. Uh, this one from Flannery O'Connor's Good Country People. Uh, the habit starts in at the first instance of the modal, the wood. Prior to that, you'd probably call it essay, I guess. Uh, you might call it reflection, though it's the start to the story, because it's reflecting things that come from the story. Uh, although, the most important point I can make about any of this is that you never actually really need to be able to break this down in any other author's work. Uh, it's useful for thinking about where they're going with their thoughts and how they're cycling through um, their thoughts. Uh, so here we are, Flannery O'Connor. Nothing is perfect. This was one of Mrs. Hopewell's favorite sayings. Another was, that is life. And still another, the most important, was, well, other people have their opinions, too. She would make these statements, usually at the table, in a tone of gentle insistence, as if no one held them but her. And the large, hulking Joy, whose constant outrage had obliterated every expression from her face, would stare just a little to the side of her, her eyes icy blue, with the look of someone who had achieved blindness by an act of will and means to keep it. When Mrs. Hopewell said to Mrs. Freeman that life was like that, Mrs. Freeman would say, I always said so myself. Nothing had been arrived at by anyone that had not first been arrived at by her. She was quicker than Mr. Freeman. When Mrs. Hopewell said to her after they had been on the place for a while, you know, you're the wheel behind the wheel, and winked. Mrs. Freeman had said, I know it. I've always been quick. It's some that are quicker than others. Everybody is different, Mrs. Hopewell said. Yes, most people is, Mrs. Freeman said. Takes all kinds to make the world. I always said it did myself. Note that habitual scenes are often a method for portraying character, as uh, we discussed when we made reference to Rust Hill and his concept of fixed action. Uh, note also how subtly Flannery O'Connor weaves between the conditional and the past perfect tenses, a shift that starts us at a loosely implied continuous present before grounding us in the scene of a single past event, the time the two biddies had a little low-stakes standoff. O'Connor blurs the boundaries here between habitual scene and what sometimes at times, sometimes at times, sounds like one singular scene. The glissando, defined in music as a continuous slide upward or downward between two notes, is the domain of the literary writer. Everything from this point on, everything down in this little subterranean zone beneath scene, will fall heavily under the auspices of the literary. Now for summary. This has a bunch of iterations, and we're going to take a look at a couple. Uh, in Trying to Be, Mary Gates Skill uses summary to zoom out from or speed up a series of conversations at a party. But what it should always have in literary fiction is some special elegant angle with a sense of intentionality. It, in this instance, meaning the summary. So here we go from uh, trying to be. Stephanie attached herself to another conversation about the embarrassing failure of an art gallery she had never heard of, which, after a rapid shift of participants, became a discussion about somebody's review in The Times versus somebody's review in The Voice. 
Sandra rapidly crossed and recrossed the floor, darting in and out of conversations with apparent pleasure and animation. Nobody's here, she hissed finally, near the hors d'oeuvres, even though there were dozens of people present. Stephanie wandered from conversation to conversation, having an almost panicky feeling that although there were nice, interesting people in the room, the situation, for all its seeming friendliness and ease, precluded her from connecting with the nice and interesting aspects of them. She tried to figure out why this was and could not, beyond the sense that the conversations around her were opening and closing, according to subtle but definite rules that no one had told her about. So this excerpt obviously crosses into reflection. But as I said, it's not actually very important that we be able to pinpoint that cleavage. In this case, the reflection is smuggled into scene by being presented as one of the thoughts Stephanie had as the party moved around her. Again, the literary writer bounces in abstract imitation of the hazy logic of the mind. One reason to jump from scene to summary is to give yourself this exact kind of space that Gateskill gives herself to work into reflective or digressive concerns. Uh, summary number two uh, zooms out a little bit further. Uh, this one comes from Robert Stone's Helping. Uh, and we're going to look here at some habitual action that the language indicates takes place over weeks or months, years ago. The Conway Library was all dark wood and etched mirrors, a gothic saloon. Years before, out of work and booze-whipped, Elliot had gone to hide there. Because Candace was a classicist's widow and knew some Greek, she was one of the few people in the valley with whom Elliot had cared to speak in those days. Eventually, it had seemed to him that all their conversations tended toward Vietnam, so he had gone less and less often. Elliot was the only Vietnam veteran Candace knew well enough to chat with, and he had come to suspect that he was being probed for the edification of the East Ilford Friends meeting. At that time, he had still pretended to talk easily about his war, and had prepared little discourses and picaresque anecdotes to recite on demand. Earnest seekers like Candace had caused him great secret distress. The chronology here gets inconclusive. Good. We're not in this scene to get a sense of all the different cardigans Candace wore through those chats across time or what the weather did that April. In movie, they'd usually shoot this as montage with a couple of costume and lighting changes. At the risk of being a fiction homer, I think this is a real disadvantage of the stage and the screen. In a movie, you can pass time quickly, but you can't also communicate something as supple and emotionally insightful as Elliot's coming to distrust Candace's intentions here. And even if you could somehow pull this off, if you could find a really nifty visual metaphor for Elliot's harrowing conclusion, you wouldn't be able to present it with that same ambiguous tone, the thing that preserves the possibility that Elliot could be self-persecutingly imagining the whole thing. The whole thing, meaning Candace's... Uh, taking their conversations back to the East Ilford Friends meeting. Literary fiction lives in these unparsable gaps in our understanding of things. If you were making a movie and you had to come up with a visual metaphor here, it would read as the word from on high, one of the auteur's little rhetorical nudges, uh, meaning you could not have that mystery. In fiction, we can inhabit that in-between space of the glissando. All right, 
Our third summary comes from Gabriel Garcia Marquez's Hundred Years of Solitude. Uh, it's pretty famous opening line. Uh, the first sentence spans nearly an entire lifetime by connecting a mere two nodes. The next few sentences dash around a little constellation of early life scenes. This sets the scene for the novel's epic scope. Many years later, as he faced the firing squad, Colonel Aurelio Buendia, Aureliano Buendia, my bad, was to remember that distant afternoon when his father took him to discover ice. At that time, Macondo was a village of 20 adobe houses built on the bank of a river of clear water that ran along a bed of polished stones, which were white and enormous like prehistoric eggs. The world was so recent that many things lacked names, and in order to indicate them, it was necessary to point. Every year, during the month of March, a family of ragged gypsies would set up their tents near the village, and with a great uproar of pipes and kettle drums, they would display new inventions. First, they brought the magnet. Okay, so... Three different examples of summary here. Uh, now I want to move on to reflection. Uh, this is from Viet Thanh Nguyen's Pulitzer winning The Sympathizer. See if you can spot the moment it switches over from what you'd call reflection to digression before tipping back into reflection. Again, not important that you be able to do this necessarily, uh, at least, you know, as kind of like a, um, as an exercise that is required of fiction writers, but I think it can be helpful to us. Bon and I said goodbye to man, and after he left in his Jeep, I tossed Bon the keys. The bombing and the gunfire had ceased, and as he drove to the, the Citroen to his apartment, he swore bloody murder at the Marine Corps the entire way. I kept my silence. One did not depend on Marines for good table manners. One depended on them to have the right instincts when it came to matters of life and death. As for the name they had called me, it upset me less than my reaction to it. I should have been used to that misbegotten name by now, but somehow I was not. My mother was native, my father was foreign, and strangers and acquaintances had enjoyed reminding me of this ever since my childhood, spitting on me and calling me bastard, although sometimes, for a variety, they called me bastard before they spit on me. Uh, this is a technique we see a lot in this type of literary story that has two timelines running, usually a present tense thing and something written in the past, uh, in the past. Um, only in bad stories is the earlier storyline used in any very discreet way to, like, explain why a character is a certain way. Usually these stories deal well with ennui and an abstract sense of loss. Reflection. So now, uh, I'll show you a little example of digression. Digression's weird because it can go just about anywhere as the name implies. Uh, this comes from uh, W.G. Sebald's uh, Rings of Saturn. It is uh, the very beginning of it, and it'll give you a sense of just how digressive that book is. Um, in August 1992, when the dog days were drawing to an end, I set off to walk the country of Suffolk in the hope of dispelling the emptiness that takes hold of me whenever I have completed a long stint of work. And in fact, my hope was realized up to a point, for I have seldom felt so carefree as I did then, walking for hours in the day through the thinly populated countryside, which stretches inland from the coast. I wonder now, however, whether there might be something in the old superstition that certain ailments of the spirit and of the body are particularly likely to beset us under the sign of the dog star. At all events, 
In retrospect, I became preoccupied not only with the unaccustomed sense of freedom, but also with the paralyzing horror that had come over me at various times when confronted with the traces of destruction, reaching far back into the past, that were evident even in that remote place. Perhaps it was because of this that, a year to the day after I began my tour, I was taken into hospital in Norwich in a state of almost total immobility. It was then that I began in my thoughts to write these pages. I can remember precisely how, upon being admitted to that room on the eighth floor, I became overwhelmed by the feeling that the Suffolk expanses I had walked the previous summer had now shrunk once and for all to a single blind, insensate spot. Indeed, all that could be seen of the world from my bed was the colorless patch of sky framed in the window. Note how trippingly he pops up in scene, letting the memory guide his hand. So, as a professor of literary fiction, it's incumbent upon me to avoid prescriptive frameworks. In that spirit, I have prepared some glancing exercises on each of these things, uh, and you should totally give them a try, maybe, or one of them, or any of them, or all of them. Uh, I've tried to collect my best kind of random tip on each, uh, but I don't want to give you the sense that these are supposed to like uh, compile into a useful framework for how to improve scenes, no matter what. Uh, don't let these pigeonhole your thinking on the way to work through this stuff. These are just uh, little kind of exercises to get the mind moving. In fact, you should try not to remember any of this. Not scene, not habit, not summary, not reflection, not digression. If it's valuable for your process, it'll stick, at least to some extent. Uh, you may find yourself wanting to revisit and reread and expand on some of the knowledge here, which, good, do it or don't. There uh, aren't any rules. <laughs> okay, so number one. Scene. If you're a young literary writer who's dreading some scene work, your problem is likely that you're not genre enough. And given that this is the only very useful realm within which to give tips that might work in genre fiction, we're going to try to make things happen, as Elmore Leonard does, via subtext. Jerry Salt says artists are cats that need to speak through third things, while art is a dog that bounds all over the viewer. Uh, if your characters are being too doggish and obvious, give them a third thing to absorb the conversation. This is something you'll recognize from movies, often in the I see you scene. In fact, you could look at Ben Stiller's deployment of the learned astronomer fable as the third thing through which he telegraphs a desirable sense of wonder. Uh, this third thing looks a lot like what in poetry uh, people often call the objective correlative. Um, Evan Gill Smith is, I know, uh, doing a lecture on the objective correlative. So if you want more on at least poetry's kind of iteration of this concept, uh, you should definitely check that out. Um, the idea is, uh, and the big example of it that I can think of off the top of my head comes from Sideways, uh, which Robert McKee breaks down in his book as being kind of an ex his book dialogue. Uh, breaks this scene from um, Sideways down. Um, in order to show us that these 
characters are using wine as an analog for themselves. They are talking about wine in a way that is there to uh, portray information about themselves. This is how people flirt or not flirt necessarily, but how, you know, uh, relationships come together. You don't just show up on a date with someone and uh, start listing, you know, like profile information and having them list their profile information back. Uh, and you don't start out by uh, talking about your theories on life. <laughs> you begin to do these things uh, subtly. And one subtle way of doing it is by taking the on the nose argument that two characters might be having and deranging it a little bit, uh, abstracting it a little bit. And the further out you abstract this third thing, the more literary you make it. If you look back over Flannery O'Connor's Good Country People, uh, you might notice that the habits she depicts look a lot like the third thing through which you'd filter a special knowledge of the characters. If we were forced to extract Mrs. Freeman's wit and wisdom into like an on-the-nose statement about what this means about her, uh, we could say that that on-the-nose statement would be the text of what is communicated, whereas the um, description that O'Connor gives is the subtext. Obviously, that's stuff that comes up in what is literally considered the text of the piece. Uh, but that's just one sort of like prism to put that information through uh, that can help us. The role of the third thing has a whole bunch of potential on the nose interpretations, but the literary writer hides these and looks for the telling details, the, thing that, the things that convince you without having to argue at all. The third thing, without having to solve for the angles that connect it to the first two, the scene's characters. So take a scene that's too on the nose, or better yet, go right out the most on the nose version of some scene that's been scaring you. Then go find a third thing to abstract out that discussion. Uh, there's an Elmore Leonard book. This is another example from uh, Robert McKee's dialogue where he introduces the concept of a trilogue uh, and uses this term third thing as well. Uh, I like this. I, I like this bit of advice. Uh, this is, you know, kind of Hollywood screenwriting advice, but I think it's absolutely useful uh, for the literary writer. And I think if you're a genre writer, it can be, uh, you know, maybe doubly useful. Uh, the other example he gives is from some other, I think, Elmore Leonard book, uh, in which a... Um, character rings the neck of a canary that is owned by the person she's arguing with. Uh, there is some, you know, connection within the dialogue, but it's a fairly subtle connection to the argument that they're having. Um, this third thing is a way of displacing um, activity and uh, emotion, which is something that once you see in fiction, in movies or something, the way that so much of uh, the action comes from like displacing, um, you know, emotions about one thing. Uh, it becomes hard to stop seeing it, I think. Anyway, go ahead, 
introduce a third thing, uh, push the logic as far into the abstract as you're, com as you're comfortable with, get weird with it, uh, good luck. Second exercise for habit. Introduce a metaphor. Communicate it via jargon in your scene. Having an overarching metaphor is a nice way to bounce between essayistic compare contrasts between the metaphor's tenor and vehicle. Um, in the case of uh, our upcoming example, the tenor of the metaphor would be Enid, and the vehicle would be Gorilla. Uh, yeah, it allows you to bounce between essayistic compare contrasts and more subtle comparisons made in the modal, not by bluntly stating the point, but instead borrowing jargon from the vocabulary of the gorilla and having it blend with Enid's jargon of suburban clutter. As in the Jonathan Franzen excerpt below. Enid faced a substantial tactical challenge. She didn't think of herself as a gorilla, but a gorilla was what she was. By day, she ferried materiel from depot to depot, often just a step ahead of the governing force. By night, Beneath a charming but too dim sconce at a too small table in the breakfast nook, she staged various actions, paid bills, balanced checks, checkbooks, attempted to decipher Medicare co-payment records and make sense of a threatening third notice from a medical lab that demanded immediate payment of 22 cents while simultaneously showing an account balance of zero dollars carried forward and thus indicating that she owed nothing and in any case offering no address to which remittance might be paid. It would happen that the first and second notices were underground somewhere, and because of the constraints under which Enid waged her campaign, she had only the dimmest sense of where those other notices might be on any given evening. She might suspect, perhaps, the family room closet, but the governing force in the person of Alfred would be watching a network news magazine at a volume thunderous enough to keep him awake, and he had every light in the family room burning, and there was a non-negligible possibility that if she opened the closet door, a cascade of catalogs and house beautifuls and miscellaneous Merrill Lynch statements would come toppling and sliding out, incurring Alfred's wrath. Yeah, um, so you can see uh, the way that metaphor can be useful. Uh, not only does it become something that you can kind of compare and contrast, uh, but it allows you to uh, slide um, into a different register, let's say, uh, from your scenes. Now your scene, um, now your scenes can kind of happen across time uh, as almost uh, a type of summary. Um, using the metaphor as essentially kind of like the goal, like proving the metaphor becomes the goal of uh, showing habitual action, right? Like that becomes the driver of how your um, like ordering what you have. Um, I'm going to step off this for just a second. Okay, and I'm back. Uh, all right.
So we've moved along to summary. Uh, the activity I have for you related to summary is to think in terms of units of characters, uh, avoiding offensive and obvious stereotyping, obviously. Um, if yours is an office gig story, talk about the flute snoots in accounting. Or if it's the army, talk about the cake eaters and Colonel Gaffney's unit. Units of characters can often be made to function in macrocosmically organic ways and often move glacially in comparison to single characters. So they can be a good way to dip into summary. In Donald Barthelme's The School, uh, we can see what I'm talking about. It wouldn't have been so bad, except that just a couple of weeks before the thing with the trees, the snakes all died. But I think that the snakes, well, the reason that the snakes kicked off was that you remember the boiler was shut off for four days because of the strike, and that was explicable. It was something you could explain to the kids because of the strike. I mean, none of their parents would let them cross the picket line, and they knew there was a strike going on and what it meant. So when things got started up again and we found the snakes, they weren't too disturbed. So, kids in this uh, sample, obviously, are functioning as a single unit, as are the snakes. Uh, and if you find some temporal gap in a story of yours and fill it with a couple of relevant character units doing stuff, uh, that's one really good way to sort of fill out a world. Uh, go ahead, give it a try. If it just seems tacked on when you do it, try to smooth out the wrinkles, maybe by sliding around the spectrum before and after, or perhaps allowing the character units themselves to inform the progression. Uh, consider turning your scene differently we're also turning it on this additional character unit centric axis. Seek out unconventional character units. Divide an office into allegiances in the Western Conference Finals, for which Sylvester was running an office pool. Find the thread that connects Agro Derrick to elderly Florence around the constellation of Portland's underdog power forward. Divide them by attitudes about the canceled team building weekend. Find some ways in which the gloaters act in unison, even as the disappointed are divvied into those who wanted to give their unhealthy competitive streaks some air, the ones who just wanted a day off, and the ones who were eagerly hoping to make some kind, any kind of friend. One of the most valuable things you can do with summary is create background subplots that enrich the foregrounded plot by bounding it ironically, exacerbating its conflicts, or introducing levity or an unexpected alliance or any shiny object to pull the reader's eyes off that sword you've got poised over their head. All right, now for reflection. Uh, my trick on reflection is to hop over to some pop psych. Uh, if you guys are familiar with pop psychology, it's kind of, uh, frequently kind of oversimplified reductivist, um, psychological tenets that, uh... I don't know, it's, I guess I would call it a, um, it is a science approximately halfway between psychology and self-help. Uh, some of it's great, some of it's goofy, some of it's uh, more useful than I think academics want to admit. A lot of it is very idiotic. Um, but Regardless, and regardless of whether you believe in any individual system at any given time, these little pop psych systems, these kind of programmatics, totalizing, schematic ways of looking at the world of divvying people up, uh, they can be a pretty good tool both for pushing and for reflecting on conflict. 
Uh, the smaller the number of categories the little pop psych scheme offers, the better. Transactional analysis, uh, if you have ever heard of this kind of 70s uh, pop psych um, movement, I guess, uh, has three of what they call ego states. Uh, the parent, the adult, and the child. Uh, in Venkatesh Rao's The Gervais Principle, workers are divided into losers, the clueless, and sociopaths, with losers equating approximately to the company's underlings, uh, the clueless being middle management, and the sociopaths being approximately the C-suite. Uh, each group gets its own richly detailed language and peccadilloes, and their uh, communication habits uh, within group and across group uh, are all um, circumscribed uh, in very kind of particular ways. It's a great book. You should totally check it out. Uh, it's, I, 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 I like it. Uh, Gretchen Rubin's The Four Tendencies breaks people down into their natural motivators, uh, meaning uh, I think the tendency has something to do with like your tendency to uh, uphold um, responsibilities motivated by either outward or inward. Um, prompting. Uh, that's, a, that's a bad example if you're interested in her, look her up. Uh, Matt Bird, uh, who I've mentioned previously in The Secrets of Story, talks about a lot of more elemental divisions between characters, such as head, heart, gut. Um, you can also have head, heart, gut, spleen, uh, head, heart, gut, genitals, uh, meaning, you know, probably a character representing, I don't know, sexual, uh, like, over-interest. Um, anyway, a million different things you can do. Uh, not only can you enact an interaction across any of these divides in scene planning, meaning I could say, Oh, I am a Gretchen Rubin, inward motivated, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I'm in a fight with a Gretchen Rubin, outward motivated, blah, blah, blah. Where would we, you know, find our, like, what points of contention would come up? And how does this sort of division between this potentially reductivist way of understanding people, how can that division inform the way uh, these people, these characters see the world and uh, these characters bounce off of each other? Um, not only can you in enact these interactions across any of these divides, uh, you can also take it one step further and spin the wheel within the scene. Uh, this is scene writing advice uh, more than it is uh, reflection advice, but I like it quite a lot and I wanted to make sure I got it in for you. Uh, so taking transactional analysis as the example, uh, we're gonna start with characters in one configuration, uh, maybe parent adult, for example. Uh, in this example, a neighbor comes over to ball out Mr. Jensen, but Mr. Jensen disarms him by addressing him humanely. Then, spin those characters into two new categories. So we have this neighbor coming by, he's trying to be a parent. He's yelling at Mr. Jensen. Mr. Jensen treats him as an adult talking to another adult, totally disarms him, maybe. Okay, great. Uh... Does the neighbor become a child at this adult reaction? Does he pout or cry or, on maybe a lyrically hopeful note, does he play show and tell with Mr. Jensen and this 
wacky little coin he found yesterday in the wood pile? Does the neighbor stay in parent configuration, but in kind of a wilting, face-saving gesture? And then the kindly Mr. Jensen, humoring him, adopts a token posture of childhood? Or maybe the neighbor's persistent parent tack turns Jensen to babyish petulance? Maybe the disarming humanity normalizes the scene at adult adult. As I said, this works as a generative tool in scene writing, but you can also apply it after the scene during reflection. If you're writing in the first person, you can have your narrators berate themselves on grounds that bear some relationship to some tenet within any of these programmatic systems. As ever, the more literary you want it, the more you'll have to abstract or hide your scaffolding. Or you can have your characters subtly elide realizations about themselves that would place them squarely within any category in any pop psych system. Maybe they try to sell themselves as adults when it's clear that they've been children. Stay as far away from the jargon of these pop psych systems as possible, unless you're really trying to satirize them. I knew I was going to say that word weird. Satirize them? Don't say babyish or old-timey in your subtle nod at T.A. Say the oafish character in this moment found an elfin smile in his arsenal, or that the hall monitor wore his hair spit-shined and polished to a high gloss, that he stood straighter than a Texaco monument. All right. Finally, number five, an exercise for digression. Very simple. Find your best paper ever. Find the best four lines. Place them before a scene that's giving you trouble. Write toward a connection. It's okay if you revise either the scene or the essay lines, even into drastically different forms. Maybe the really insightful thing you said about Napoleon's fall gets turned into a treatise on ambition, or maybe it gets transferred to a fantasy about the Napoleonic fall of your protagonist's rival. Maybe you invert it, and it becomes about the rise of the protagonist's favorite J-pop group, Nippon Leon. Maybe you shift it, but seriously. Maybe the protagonist's father's proverbial Waterloo gets some unexpected play right as the protagonist is entering a fight for his professional life. Maybe Napoleon comes to your protagonist in a dream. Maybe your protagonist can't remember any French, can't seem to speak in anything but bullhorn feedback. How far out can you bring it? Challenge yourself. But, as always, write to some extent towards something you feel like you've figured out. All right, so that ends it. I hope something in here has been useful to you. I hope I did not say anything too stupid or um, idiotic. Thank you for joining me. Uh, thank you again to Pace University, uh, to Dana Cadman, um, and thank you so much for joining me. I hope it is useful. Yeah.